Uh, well, Gordon, thank you so much for the introductions, including uh, the uh, introduction about next year's conference. Uh, we're delighted to be working with Gordon and partners on planning the 2012 Meeting of the Minds. <clears throat> um, thanks to all of you for hanging out for this, this session at the, uh, at the tail end. Um, I'm Bill Shutkin, as Gordon mentioned, President and CEO of the Presidio Graduate School, really the first and uh, leading graduate school focused exclusively on sustainable management. We offer MBA, MPA, and executive ed uh, in sustainability um, and are seriously considering adding a smart city research capability to our school's graduate agenda. Uh, so we'll look forward to working with many of you uh, on that development process. As Gordon noted, and here's John, um, this is a panel to discuss uh, sourcing urban innovation from the ground up and the top down, uh, a bit of a mouthful. But I'm gonna try to quickly reframe the subject matter uh, and we'll be asking the panelists to address it in this way um, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. We're gonna try to finish up at noon, uh, having been compressed just a little bit. Um, and the reframe is to suggest that the, the subject matter for this panel is really what I would call the mind-body problem uh, for cities, the mind-body problem. Think about cities as at once embodied, material and physical, and simultaneously cities as cerebral, as cognitive, or at least as aspiring to possess cognitive capabilities. Um, and the problem is this, we've become very proficient, I would argue, at engineering our cities for smartness, for the kinds of capabilities and performance that we've been talking about here. Um, but we are arguably less capable um, uh, at, at the other side. The, the neurology of our cities is still very much under development. Uh, and that neurology is essentially the, con the collective intelligence uh, uh, through which or by which we manage and control the tools and gadgets that so many of us are excited about and rightly so uh, in terms of the future of our cities. Um, my favorite contemporary historian and cultural critic Jill Lepore. How many of you know Jill Lepore's writings? Anybody here? Bancroft winning historian, uh, novelist, uh, teaches at Harvard and writes for The New Yorker, has said this about uh, technology and the human mind. Technology can be sublime, but machines aren't something that happens to us. They're something we make. That is, they're less like meteors that come crashing into our planet than like toddlers. Sure, they crash into you a lot and change your life, but they didn't come out of nowhere. And if you set your mind to it, you can teach them manners before they, get to, before they become bigger than you. <laughs> IT, ICT is both a tool to be managed and a tool for managing simultaneously. It's a tool for expressing our desires and aspirations and our wants, a tool uh, a, a way of, of managing cities for smartness. Cogito ergo sum herbs. I think, therefore, I am a city, uh, is the new maxim that planners and builders alike, I think, are, uh, are shooting for. So how can we best use IT to think and act collectively so as to operate our cities better, smarter, more sustainably? How do we best manage technology to optimize uh, environmental performance? and the quality of life for our cities? And how do we better align the mind and the body of our cities, the physical and the cognitive, so as to achieve the practices, the behaviors, the policies that will really guide us forward in a way the tools on their own uh, cannot? We have three panelists who are really at the forefront of uh, the neurology, if you will, of, of cities, the neuroscience of city building. Uh, and let me quickly introduce them. I'm gonna ask them to keep their remarks to roughly eight minutes, given the, the time, and try to leave as much time as possible for your intelligence to be brought to bear uh, on the conversation. We'll start uh, to, my, to my left, speaker's left, uh, with Ben Berkowitz, who is the CEO and co-founder of cclickfix.com. Try saying that 10 times fast, or even five. Uh, to, to Ben's right is uh, the mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee, 
uh, Ron Littlefield, and those of you who read Outside Magazine, used to be published here in Boulder, now out of Santa Fe, will know that as of last week, Chattanooga is the country's most perfect city, uh, well ahead of Boulder, Portland, Seattle, and many others for its quality of life, and in particular, its, its outdoor uh, and environmental amenities. So congratulations. They are also, of course, home to the first 100x broadband capability in the country. Uh, so the mayor has, has a lot to say. Uh, and then to the mayor's right, John Williams, who's a senior vice president and many other things, also a PhD uh, uh, for community planning and design at HDR, a leading uh, uh, sustainability consulting firm. Uh, John works out of New York, but based in Nebraska. Uh, is that correct? Yes. And working with Chattanooga. So we'll start then, Ben, uh, with you, 8 to 10, uh, and go through, and then some questions. Thanks. Does this work? It does. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I, I guess I'm the bottom up of this, this conversation, uh, which, which we're fine with. Uh, I'm going to give you a little history on C-Click Fix, where it came from, why it, why it exists, and, and I think also why it's spread uh, so far. Um, so I am standing in my backyard in New Haven, Connecticut about three and a half years ago. And uh, my dog is barking at the wall on my neighbor's building because there is this a uh, terribly ugly piece of graffiti. Um, not, not Banksy or Shepard Fairey or any of the great artists of our day. I would appreciate them coming to my house. Uh, if they're listening, please do. Um, but, but something that really needed to be removed and it was a blight on our community. And of course, the first thing I did was I went and talked to my neighbor about removing it. He doesn't like me uh, and he didn't want to remove it. And so uh, the next thing I did what I thought was the logical thing to do at the time was call City Hall. And um, three years ago, I think in most city halls, there was no, the idea of 311 had been born in New York City, so customer service for government. But uh, they're really, in small towns like New Haven, there was no web portal for connecting with the city. So uh, I'm calling City Hall. I'm trying to find out who uh, removes graffiti. and. Um, I find that the Livable Cities Initiative does it. I leave about five voicemails, and uh, I don't get much of a response. And at some point while leaving one of these voicemails or waiting on hold, I, I had this thought that I bet my neighbors have reported the exact same thing. I have no way of knowing that. I have no way of supporting them. It would be really great if this was publicly documented. And uh, so I bounced this off my now co-founders, uh, co and I said, you know, what if we create a web platform where you can publicly document these issues. Um, one of my co-founders had seen Fix My Street in the UK. We took a look at that and decided that it wasn't uh, scalable at that point. And so we sat down on a Sunday and we built a little uh, map in about four hours where you could click on a Google map and post uh, a problem like a pothole or graffiti or a street light that was out. And uh, then we took it to our friends at Sunday dinner and uh, lo and behold, they had a lot of these issues as well, and so they tested it out. We decided it was a good idea. We spent about three months launching it, um, and in those three months, we, we built uh, probably the most disruptive piece of the technology. Uh, it wasn't just that uh, we were uh, allowing people to publicly document their concerns, but we created a way uh, for those concerns to be directly delivered to their local governments. Uh, we created what you call what we call watch areas. These are free-formed uh, geographical boundaries drawn on a map, and uh, when an issue is reported in a watch area, an email is sent uh, to local government. So we spent about uh, a year doing this nights and weekends, reaching out to people, and I had this Google alert uh, for the word pothole. That was how we found like-minded people, was people who wanted to talk about potholes. And uh, the Boston Globe started talking about potholes, um, and when the Boston Globe talks about potholes, people do listen. They had created a Google map of their own uh, to document potholes. I called them, I said, we can do uh, better than that because we can alert governments and we can make this easier and more user friendly. They said, great, uh, within a week we're on boston.com and we uh, realized that we had a business model. And um, so now uh, we're embedded in about 900 local, local news sites uh, who uh, are all connecting citizens to their governments all over the country, even uh, somewhat internationally. Um, and, and that spread really quickly. And of course, uh, we got government's attention at the same time. Um, 
three years ago, there was not really an open government movement. Um, I, I think I probably had a, a lot of enemies in City Hall. Um, but that's all changed really quickly uh, as governments see uh, the, or the, the people in government who saw that customer service were important either got elected or uh, suddenly were getting the microphones at City Hall. And so uh, we ended up um, building a suite of products for governments to help them manage uh, social customer service uh, through C Click Fix. And uh, we have a set of tools that actually allows citizens to report through C Click Fix and generate work orders inside the city's exact, uh, existing business process. And it's, it's been really an, an incredible experience to be in a, a place of such disruption and then a place of real partnership where uh, the end result is a greatly increased uh, civic uh, space and, and a place for people to participate. We joke around um, because, you know, we, of course, we've created a tool that's allowed hundreds of thousands of, of uh, these issues to be documented and about 55% of them to be fixed, that we haven't just created a megaphone um, for complaining. We, we really believe that potholes are the gateway drug to civic engagement. <laughs> um, and and the, reason, the reason we say that is because we see all these people that, you know, that they come through the Boston Globe and their local news sites and they want to, uh, they, they're frustrated, they're upset, they're like I was when I, or my dog was when we were looking at this bad graffiti. And, and we want a place to vent, but we don't expect a feedback loop for resolution. And, um, C Click Fix allows the feedback loop for resolution. Social media tools allow that feedback loop for resolution. And we see that when governments and others who can solve these problems come on board and, and resolve these issues or explain why the issues are unresolvable from lack of you know, uh, tax dollars or, or uh, the ability to, to pave a road, um, that can really encourage people to do other things. And some of those other things include planting trees, uh, helping to design public spaces. We have people who have uh, done Google SketchUp videos of uh, what a bike lane would look like going down Elm Street in New Haven. Uh, we have people who are helping to distribute information about storms. Uh, and you know, I think, I'll give one example. I think most recently this kind of all came together, this partnership between citizen media and government uh, on this open platform uh, with Hurricane Irene. And we had uh, the state of Maryland uh, using the tool in the uh, emergency management services to get extra data from citizens on things that were wrong and enabling citizens to talk to each other about how they might be able to help each other. We had cities like Richmond and Raleigh and New Haven who were all using the same platform and we had all the media, a, a ton of media um, properties up and down the East Coast from the Washington Post to Boston.com all broadcasting this information real time. And so we have everything from people reporting that their power is out on our mobile application when, when they can't use the web in their home, uh, to after the storm, someone uh, reporting that they're, they found a lost cat, which they've named Irene. They believe that it's you know, <laughs> there because of the storm. And all this, this connectivity is, of course, making communities stronger. Um, so I, I have a few slides here. I was just going to, I was asked to. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to show the, the platform. Where do I click? That's it. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we understand this. People report issues, and when they go to see Click Fix, they're distributed out to government, utilities, and everyone in the community that can help solve a problem. This is what our site looks like. Uh, you can see a number of publicly documented issues mapped. Uh, people can vote up issues to help governments and others prioritize them. And uh, this is one of our uh, government features we've developed based on you know, feedback from our government partners. It's a dashboard. It's a light CRM for tracking and acknowledging these issues. Governments can purchase this from us for as little as $100 a month uh, compared to, I think uh, Anish Chopra, the federal CTO, goes around with a slide that says New York City's uh, 311 costs $50 million a year, and this costs 1200 um, I think they're doing a few more things, but we're not really sure. <coughs> This is a mobile application we built. You can take a photo uh, of the problem, get the GPS location, and uh, it's public and documented and submitted to the government. And that's the click fix. Thanks. Thanks ben. And efficient, too. Thanks, Ben. Mayor?
Well, I prepared two PowerPoint presentations, and I'm not going to use either of those. Instead, I'm going to challenge you to use your imagination. So I'm going to blast through about 250 years of history in eight minutes. And feel free to close your eyes and just envision what I'm going to be talking about. Having said that, if you doze off, I'll think they're not really sleeping. They're just listening intently <laughs> and paying attention. Uh, Chattanooga is not a unique city. It's a city in a bowl. Now, we're sitting in a city in a bowl. And if you go around the world, you'll find a lot of cities in a bowl or on a harbor, on a river, on some kind of water, because water was the way commerce was done way back when in the beginning. And Chattanooga was one of those cities. We have a beautiful downtown, if I could show you the slide, bisected by a beautiful river now. But it wasn't always that way. It started as a trading post. It was Indian territory, Native Americans, Cherokees, Creeks, and all of that. But soon after the trading post, industry came. Now this is a little unique. In the South, most cities relate to agriculture or if it's industry, it's textiles or whatever. In Chattanooga, it was hot metals. It was an unusual city, a Rust Belt city in the South, some have called it not your normal southern community. And as you fast forward through slides of the city's progression from the time that it started, the smokestacks are gathering. You see more and more smokestacks on the maps and the drawings and ultimately the photographs of the early city of Chattanooga because everyone was very proud of those smokestacks. You know, that meant industry, that meant prosperity. Then came rail that other channel of commerce, Chattanooga famous for that, Chattanooga Choo Choo. And during the heyday of the rail era, we were a rail head, just like Atlanta, a city not, uh, not unlike Atlanta at that time, crossroads of major rail. And during the, uh, the time of steam engines, of course, that just added more smoke. Then roads, we were already a crossroad of of the U.S. Uh, highway system, and as the interstates were built, Chattanooga became a crossroads of the interstate system as well. And through the 1950s and 60s, our prominence as a heavy industrial town continued. And then in 1969, and I said all that to lead up to this, we were characterized by Walter Cronkite on his evening news when he announced that the dirtiest city in America was in fact Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1969, a little over 40 years ago. A real wake up call for our city or any city. And in this conference, we've talked a lot about carbon footprint and ours was a city and I was there at the time. I'd just gotten out of college and moved to Chattanooga in 1968. We had a carbon footprint that you could actually see and sometimes you could taste it. You could smell it almost always. Hot metal industries. And we have a famous picture, which we usually drop into all of our slide presentations. It shows a car disappearing into a smog bank, a cloud. And it's not retouched. It's pretty dramatic. Chattanooga in 1969. So in the 1970s, we began to clean up our act. And uh, we did that mechanically. The 1980s are critical to how Chattanooga changed, how it became a different culture. It was an old industrial city, believed that it couldn't change, and we started to bring people together in groups not unlike this, and we would challenge them with things like in the mid-1980s, we would point out, now, looking at you here and talking at this time on this side of the millennium change, we don't think about it so much, but in the mid-1980s, no one really believed that the year 2000 was coming. And so we would challenge people by saying, you know, the year 2000 is 16 years away, 15 years away. And over the course of 26 weeks, we had 52 meetings with people. And we listened intently. And we wrote things down in their own words. And we captured their dreams and visions and challenged them to think of our community in new and different ways. Now remember what I said about being a rail center because it played a critical role in what Chattanooga has today, which is something very different and unique. In the 1980s, 
companies went throughout the country and laid fiber, a new means of communication along the rail routes. And so Chattanooga became a crossroads of that. The information superhighway suddenly linked our community to those big think tanks, Oak Ridge, Georgia Tech, Huntsville. But we didn't know quite what to do with it. In the 1990s, we reclaimed our riverfront. I have some beautiful before and after pictures. If you've got your eyes closed, think about a city that was dark and gray and ugly and, and depressed and dilapidated warehouses along the river and then very quickly, a dramatic change. An aquarium, an audacious idea, way back when we originally thought of it. And uh, new life, new vitality, children playing on the riverfront and all of that. We had electric buses back in the 1990s. We were talking about electric buses yesterday and I'm not talking about buses with catenaries, I'm talking about battery powered buses because we knew as an old polluted city, if we were going to do something different, we had to do it in a very different fashion to capture the future and where it's going. Our buses now are getting old. It's time for new technology. And one thing I've gained from this gathering is some glimpses of what that new technology just might be. Yesterday, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency issued a list of cities that were in compliance and out of compliance with the critical air pollution measurements. Chattanooga is not on that list, I'm proud to say. We are in compliance with everything. Then came the smart grid. And our city-owned utility came to me and said, you know, we can do this two ways. We can do it with the old technology, with the old wires or whatever, or we can do it in the way the future will require, with fiber to every home, to every business, 170,000 connections in a 600 square mile area that actually extends out beyond the city limits. And so we decided to go for it. And we did a business plan and we decided and we learned that if we properly managed the electrical system, we could actually pay for that fiber to the home with that business plan, with that, uh, with that new innovation. So uh, then came the downturn in 2008 and that sounds like a real downer but it turned out well for us because they were looking for shovel ready projects and we had one that was already shoveling and we applied for and received a 111 million dollar grant that enabled us to move faster and to get it in place and to serve those hard to serve neighborhoods and such that would have been expensive to extend that technology to so we moved fast and we built a system that is the fastest system in the United States I was in a gathering in Denmark week before last and a man put a world map up. He was speaker before me. And he said, you know, there are only a handful of communities in the world, over 100,000 population, with access to gigabit connectivity. Some of you technical people understand that better than I do. I'm a city planner by background. I don't think in gigabits. I think in yards and setbacks and zoning. But I was very proud of the fact that there were a half a dozen or so in Europe, a couple in Asia and so forth, and one dot in the United States, and that was Chattanooga, Tennessee. Well, that's not enough. We have to have a wireless system on top of that, and they've skipped through these two or three um, slides that we had here about the mesh system. But a mesh, I am told, is a citywide self-healing wireless system utilizing the fiber backbone connecting anything, anytime, anywhere. When we announced our new fast internet service, of course the naysayer said no one will ever need that. You don't need that much speed and doctors in the audience raised their hand and said we do. We can use it. If we can watch an MRI on a high definition screen at home and we can, we can actually advance our, uh, our cause and we can serve our patients better, we can use it. Of course the scientists and the engineers said we can use it. And then as I was leaving the room there were a group of disheveled looking young people and I said you guys what are you in and they said video and I said is this good news for you and they said oh this is wonderful we can ship stuff back and forth without having to compress it I'm not sure what that means but it sounded good <laughs> we're using it for traffic control for security cameras for lighting for laptop access for fire and police and so what's next I tell people it's like a city 
that has discovered fire in other cities are looking at us and thinking we can do something with that. So if you're looking for the future, Chattanooga has transformed itself and we've done it by engaging our people way back in the 80s, empowering them, listening to them, and then jumping ahead uh, with a great deal of audacity sometimes, but with confidence that the future is where the city needs to be. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Mayor, and for also sticking to the time frame. How many of us have had a mayor actually do that? No wonder Chattanooga is way ahead, so thank you. Uh, and next is John, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, I want to begin by saying that this conference, Meeting of the Minds, has made me much smarter already, and I just got here last night because I got promoted to a PhD oh, well, just by coming here. Mind. Well, it's not me, but I'll take it. <laughs> okay, so thank you for that. And Bill, you, you made the reference to the, the, to the mind and the body, and I represent the architecture, engineering, and planning industry, and I describe us as the neck or the spine that connects those two areas of your, of your physical body. And, and it's the architects and engineers who often work with those apps that we're talking about to actually make things happen in a community. So what I'm gonna talk about over the next just couple minutes is a data-driven approach to better informing city dwellers to be part of their community, be part of their community development process. And until recently, until we had access to this data like you're providing, Ben, uh, a lot of public policy was set based on antidote, or is it antidote or antidote? Anecdote, right, rather than fact and hard data. And now these apps are giving us the ability to create visions and do planning around hard facts and performance data that'll give us the ability to make much better decisions going forward. I have this little graphic here, and it describes sort of the, uh, a normal economic development, community redevelopment process beg often begins with visioning. And with the benefit of these apps, we plan to precede that process by gathering critical data. And it used to be we would gather data that would tell us a bit about land use and about traffic flow and perhaps energy and water and things like that. But now we want data that tells us about crime and tells us about lighting and tells us about aesthetics and where people want to be and where they want to go to school and how their lives actually operate. We want data that tells us when you're in the room or not. And there is such data right now, and we're tapping it in Chattanooga as well as other places. So this data is going to inform our decision-making, our visioning process, and that'll give us much better plans. <clears throat> just imagine that, plans based on the facts rather than just guesses or what the TV is saying today. Uh, I'll, I want to hold up an example, and I hope that you folks are interested in this. I have 25 of these. They weigh 10 pounds altogether. And I don't want to carry them back, but this actually comes from the city of Chattanooga. It's called a visioning document, Chattanooga Strategies for Smarter Sustainability. And the, the latest round of activity in Chattanooga is, is recognizing that performance data can make our city not only more sustainable, but more competitive in the global marketplace. And we decided that we want to invite the best and the brightest from around the world to come to Chattanooga and use it as a laboratory. It's already smart, it's got a great reputation and brand. Come to Chattanooga and bring a proof of concept with you. Something that will make us even smarter or more competitive. Something that will save us energy and greenhouse gas emissions and give us a better community to live in. And so over the course of the last several months, more than a dozen world-class companies came to Chattanooga with their concept. And this little booklet basically describes the approach and how we've taken those concepts and packaged them into six bundles, and those bundles over the next several months will move into further detailed, or, uh, detailed discussion and hopefully letters of commitment by the end of this year. So if you're interested, I've got them with me and I'd be happy to share them with you. <clears throat> now once we have those concepts, it's not good enough to have an interesting or a sexy plan. It's time to do some hard assessment. After all, money is not growing on trees and communities more than ever have to make sure they're getting the greatest bang for the buck and so in in the way we would use a data-driven approach is we would say and by the way i spoke just a few moments ago i talked a little bit about this i i want to take every vision and turn it into a sustainable business plan i want to know how the elements of that vision 
are going to use the community's resources to create jobs. And I don't, don't just tell me it's going to produce five jobs. I want to know how many will be direct, how many will be indirect, how many will be induced, what are they going to pay, where are they going to be located, and how long are they going to last. I want that to be part of the business case. And I also want that business case to include a, a monetary uh, projection as to what the social, environmental, and economic costs and benefits will be for that particular project. And I want to know what the odds of realizing those benefits are actually going to be. Because th this is an important point. When you generally write a business plan, 99.9% .9 of them concentrate only on the direct cash benefits of the undertaking. Well, when you're a community, or if you're a community using state or federal dollars, you're doing things for the public good. So not ca direct cash and non-cash matter. Things like energy saved, waste avoided, water avoided, community health and productivity, those types of things are non-cash benefits that can accrue to the community. That should be in the business plan in dollar terms and probabilities of outcomes. As should the criteria air contaminants and greenhouse gas emissions. If you're using federal dollars, they matter in terms of public policy. Let's quantify the value of those things, put that in the plan. And then lastly, let's talk about the resilience. Now, one speaker earlier, TJ actually mentioned, you know, he's going to make decisions or the state of Colorado is going to make investment decisions based on jobs, security, the environment, and costs. Okay. Well, resilience is part of security. Extreme weather events have hit Chattanooga mighty hard this year. No one ever imagined how they would hit that city. Well, let's talk about, you know, if you're making investments in a new water treatment plant, let's talk about how resilient will be, it will be when that tor tornado comes through town. All those things should be part of the assessment and part of that, that apps-driven, data-driven process. Ultimately, you're going to get to implementation and you're going to have to choose. So which project do you move forward with? Okay. Every community has a, a whole truckload of projects. Which ones do you go forward with? Well, you go forward with the projects that deliver the greatest sustainable return on investment. Direct cash, the triple bottom line, jobs and resilience. And then finally, monitoring, I think, is going to be more important than ever because people want to know not only what you did with, your, with their money, but how did that work out? You made claims about jobs or the environment or dollars. Tell me how you're going to monitor performance. So this app and data-driven process will create a database or a platform against which you can measure your progress and report out to the community the results that you produced in exchange for their, their dollars. So to just conclude, I, again, I'll go back to TJ's point, and I made it even earlier today. If you're a community, certainly a community, be prepared to make a business case. It is the only way that you're going to compete for resources and win. And it's not good enough just to talk about cash. You have to talk about the other things, and this is why. There, there are a series of events that are already occurring, beginning with competitive grant programs, that look across that spectrum of benefits. So right off the bat, number one, if you want to compete and win, you've got to master that into the business case. This week in New York City, the AFL-CIO and the American Federation of Teachers, and I'm just about finished, Bill, uh, announced a plan to root $10 billion of pension fund monies into infrastructure projects that produce these kinds of benefits. Well, at $10 billion is pretty good. There's only a trillion dollars worth of demand. How are they going to sort through a trillion dollars worth of opportunities? They're going to look at the case. The emergence of I-banks, they're going to look at the case. Uh, all sorts of areas like this are going to reinforce this point mighty fast, so thank goodness we have access to this data and these apps and we've got people in this room who are going to help us make an even more richer, robust use of those materials. So in the end, the mayor's city is going to do a better job spending money there, but they're also going to be more competitive and they're going to be players in the global marketplace as a result. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, so let's open the floor for questions. I'd like to start and seed the question with uh, a proposition to the mayor, which is, in the age of diminished, uh, if not bankrupted, public uh, tr treasuries, you've made the case that there's still much work to be done, uh, including leveraging federal or other monies. To what extent, A, 
has your investment in broadband and technology begun to produce ROI, cost savings? And secondly, who do you look to as a city in this country or around the world as your prime competitors now in this sort of new race to the top? Uh, who are you learning from the most? And I'd love for the audience to participate. We've got a mic, and, and let's generate some dialogue. Okay. Um, first of all, what we have created is a platform for solving problems and for being far more efficient. I mean, the, the, clearly, we can use things like C-Click Fix for doing the, the necessary services, for, for providing the, uh, the, the response to uh, complaint calls and such, which is very important to people. Are, are you using C-Click Fix? Uh, we're talking with them right now. This, sure. is, this is new technology. We've had, we've had a 311 reporting system since, uh, oh, for nearly a decade. And actually, back in the 1980s, we started a computerized system before anybody was really doing that. So we've been working on this for a long time. But what we have with the fiber as the backbone and the mesh that we're just beginning to build out is the ability to do a lot of very interesting and intricate things that there's not sufficient time for us to really talk about. I mean, police and fire use of that system to be able to download information if you're answering a fire, to be able to retrieve the plans of the building that you're going into in police situations. I mean, we're right out here very close to Columbine where that tragic uh, school situation occurred some years ago. And so now we have the ability to build out our schools with cameras and rooms and, and places in schools and policemen can access it by laptop in real time and know exactly what they're going into. They're going to talk about lighting after this. We have a park where we've been experiencing flash mobs, if anyone knows what that is. That used to be a fun thing where people would tweet each other and they would all show up and they'd have a spontaneous dance or song or whatever. Well, the criminal element learned that you can do the same thing and you can overwhelm a department store or you can take over a park. Well, we now have the ability to basically go online, the policeman can, and we have refitted our parks and, and parts of our public spaces, particularly in the downtown area, with state-of-the-art lighting, LEDs, and uh, uh, other types of high-efficiency lighting. But it's just like a rheostat. We can keep the, the lighting level low for those times when we want it low, or the police can go in and they can ramp it up basically to daylight quality very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we're doing uh, a lot of the, the regular mundane things, but we're experimenting with a lot of new things. And what we have is a platform that's unmatched. Uh, and who do we look to? Basically, anytime you think you're leading, you're looking over your shoulder at who's coming behind you. We know we have a short period of time when we're going to be in this leadership position. We look to Silicon Valley. We look to all of those, those high-tech areas. And there are little pockets of smaller communities that have high-speed internet, and we're looking to see how quickly that, speed, uh, that uh, spreads and is adopted by other communities. Great. And it, and it doesn't hurt when you have a sustainability director named Davy Crockett. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's the, he is, well, indeed. I'm not sure. You know, he says that. We're, we're, we're still researching He does that. say it. Great. So, um, <laughs> sir, if you could introduce yourself and yeah. pose the question. Thanks. Rod Stevens, I've got a, a question for the mayor. And uh, about a year ago, I was speaking with the director of your Arts Alliance, talking about um, this was a group that brought together artists for a lot of inner city revitalization. And she brought up two points that really stuck in my mind about some of the dynamics of how you translated planning into actually on the ground things. And I wondered if you could elaborate on them. One was, uh, she said that a lot of this went back to simply creating a list of things to do in the community and taking them down one at a time and getting things done, that the community learned how to get stuff done together, but that a lot of this was just plain old working together and having a list to work off of. And then the second thing that she said about her own organization that was pretty intriguing to me, and I haven't encountered this elsewhere, is that to lend urgency to her own organization, which was funded by some foundation, that instead of going the bricks and mortar route and getting established and ramping up and having a membership, that they had a countdown clock that they were going to go out of date by. And that every day she woke up and thought about how many more days she had to get something done. This struck me as kind of a marvelous way to add urgency to the situation. I wondered if you could comment on your own experience with us. Well, we've had a series of organizations that had a deadline like that. And the one you're talking about is set to expire and they're 
planning to go out in grand fashion. They're calling it supernova. You know, and, and so that, that to me is good because organizations tend to hang around sometimes and try to find new, new things to do and they lose their effectiveness. Uh, we use creativity and the thing that we really do, and it sounds like common sense, but we learn that if you engage the public, if you have public meetings and you listen intently to people and you write things down fully transparent while they're watching in their own words, that they give it more credibility. If you don't try to change or twist or spin what they're saying, and then come out with a very simple summary, and there are ways to do that without, without violating uh, uh, the, the sanctity of the process, if you will. And uh, people tend to support that which they have to create. So then you just engage people in picking off those, those items. Uh, and we did this 25, 30 years ago, and it built up a momentum, and we now, when we call a meeting on something like, what do we do about the library? And we're working on the library right now because there's a, a cultural institution everywhere that the digital age is changing dramatically. But it used to be if we'd call a public meeting, it was like when the highway department calls, when you get a handful of people and it was kind of a, a, a fixed process. But people now expect to come, they ha expect to be engaged and they expect the city to act on their recommendations. And we have kept that such that now when we have a meeting, you know, we have hundreds of people turn out. It used to be that maybe we'd get 50. Now hundreds come and get engaged and they go home and they tell their neighbors, their opinion leaders, and opinion leaders are like yeast. It spreads throughout the community and it enables us to get things done. It enables the city council to take tough stands on things. And gee, that sounds like uh, Pollyanna's type of thinking, but it really, really works. So are you, and, and this is a question for the panel and generally, but John, you had talked about data-driven approach uh, uh, to <coughs> community planning and development. You've just now celebrated, uh, Mayor, the engagement in your community. It sounds very informed, if not enlightened. Um, I don't know about you, but I am still experiencing in many communities, including this one, uh, our dear city of Boulder, Colorado, what I would characterize as fact-free zones. Uh, when it comes to discussions about important public matters, whether it's economic development, real estate development, or the like. Are we really seeing as a result of technology, as a result of folks being able to participate and own their data, uh, a transformation in, in the way we think and deliberate as collectives? Or is what we're seeing in Congress, these shouting matches, these echo chambers in conflict, uh, it's still very much the, the norm, at least as, as I'm seeing it. John? If I could take the first crack at that, I, uh, like many people in this room, we use charrette processes to gather a lot of information in a short amount of time. And what we've done now is we've equipped those processes with a, a pretty big dose of data or data generating capacity. And we'll talk about a specific project from a social or environmental or economic perspective. Uh, often there'll be someone in the audience with a pet peeve, you know, for instance, maybe uh, an elderly person will hold up a certain type of plastic bottle and say, until you figure out a way to recycle this bottle, I'm going to oppose this project forever and ever and ever. And in the past, the consulting and planning teams and staff would debate her, and they would go round and round about this plastic bottle, and it could go for months and months and could burn up a lot of time and money. Well, now we have the ability to say, well, let's take a look at that bottle and what does it really mean in terms of water and energy and greenhouse gas and safety and all these things. And we can run real-time analysis right in front of her or him and in front of that television camera. And we can say, uh, we see that that bottle doesn't move the, noddle, the, the needle at all. But we've wasted a lot of time and money here, so do we want to keep doing this? Or we, we might see that that bottle really could move the needle. So why are we pushing back so hard? Let's make the decision and solve that problem and move on with it. Or we might see that it doesn't really cost anything to deal with that bottle and we can just get the project going. But whatever it is, we see it real time. And if, if their case doesn't hold up, then it, they tend to shrink mighty rapidly and go away. I, we had another example, an, an airport runway project out in Western Canada we, where we spent five years fighting about this airport runway that was really critical to the, to the, the local economy. 
And you can understand why you'd fight about that, but when we figured out how to run the analysis for the costs and benefits and risks, et cetera, real time in front of these audiences, we solved that problem like that. And there's a runway there today and airplanes taken off as we speak. So it, you know, if you, you can take a cheap shot in a public meeting, get away with it unless we can sort of check you and then show everybody else what your favorite project really means to the community. It may mean something really great to, great. sorry for that long no, answer. Good answer. We're trying to move toward actual interactivity where people can actually work, I mean, communicate with us from their homes. We're already using the internet quite a bit. Uh, innovation such as this is moving us really in the right direction very dramatically and very quickly. But the world has changed over the last 10 years. I'm the first mayor to carry a Blackberry or a smartphone. Smartphones are evolving so quickly and the smartphone apps are evolving so quickly. I think the real challenge to communities now, and we're fortunate in Chattanooga to have the platform, both the basic fiber and the mesh system that will enable us to keep ahead or at least keep up with the technology and to keep up with bright minds like this which are thinking of new ways to make managing cities more efficient and more effective. Yeah, I think, you know, in Ch Chattanooga is a really interesting example. Um, Liz Henley is, I, I don't know if she's a 311 director, but yeah. Yeah. she's in, you know, she's one of the first people probably two years ago uh, in city government who started receiving these emails and didn't even think twice about publicly responding to them. It just made sense. Someone was communicating with city government and she decided that she was going to communicate back. Uh, so we, we obviously really champion Liz. I mean, she's using a free tool that's, that's giving more access to Chattanooga. Um, Chattanooga, I also think, stands out in other ways. Uh, I've uh, spoken with a number of people down there. I think you have the, lar the most inclusive uh, uh, visioning study. Uh, we try to. Yeah, 20,000 people. 25,000 respondents in a visioning yeah. study. Maybe. Yeah, out of a population. Of 170,000 in right. the city. Yeah. So, you know, we started to see I examples like Chattanooga that suddenly city government's uh, initiatives were making it into our slide decks when we were presenting, which I think was surprising to people. Um, and then, you know, I think that no matter which side of the, the, the aisle you're on, uh, the open government partnership that was just announced uh, by Barack Obama on Tuesday, uh, something that C Click Fix is part of, uh, is uh, just absolutely amazing and uh, a real testament to how the federal government is taking initiatives with open data and, and, and listening to not only citizens but to their employees as to how do they drive efficiency. Um, and, and, you know, I've been to this. I, I was at State Department uh, when they announced in June uh, and there were, you know, leaders from European countries and South American countries and, and African countries who have only been a democracy uh, for eight years, and uh, it seems like everybody just gets that, that listening is the way forward. Um, probably the best example, I think, uh, that you're going to see in the next year is uh, what's going to happen in Chicago. I have a feeling, um, I mean, we saw it the day that Daly left office. All of the departments in Chicago started responding on C-Click Fix. It was like a, a veil had been lifted. Um, you know, and, and I have friends in the old administration, I have friends in the new administration, uh, there were a lot of, there's always good people in government who want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think Chicago will be a really good example of the veil of secrecy being lifted and, and what the future of local government will look like. <clears throat> Why don't we do one more question if folks are willing? Uh, no, no, it, let's do, no. keep the question in the air. We ask the question, but we may not get a chance to do the response now. Okay, good. An air question. question. The question is important. Okay, great. Um, uh, Darren Dinsmore from Crowdbright, and uh, we've actually worked with uh, William on a project in our beta test to create a digital charrette tool so that we can actually do this in real live meetings, uh, make them much more efficient, about 300% more efficient, and in real time live on the web at the same time in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find uh, that I guess the, the barrier and the challenges of running these in-person meetings uh, and improving access at the same time. Great. This is actually going to be something that we're going to talk about for Meeting of the Minds with Bill because the next time we, we do this, we're going we're to be changing the format, I suspect. Great. 
Great, Gordon. Thanks, guys, to our panel. Wonderful jobs. Great work being Thank done. Thank you. Yes. Thanks to all of you for hanging out.